in these modern times, it's never been a better time to know yourself. And the question has always been, how do you know yourself? How do you know who you truly are? So, regardless of what age you are, you could be 15 years old, you could be 20 years old, you could be 50 years old. And this question will come up. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Do you know who you really are? And that may sound like a outlandish question. It may sound like a question that is way up in the clouds. It may sound impractical. But I have a tool for you today that can answer that question. At least get you as close as just about any other method. There are many methods to learning who you are. In ancient times and in other societies, we had a process for discovering a person's core identity and core personhood through rites of passage. You had rites of passage which were trials, tests, experiences that you went through under supervision, under guidance of elders, of highly seasoned and experienced mentors that guided you through a process that transformed you and through that journey, you became aware of what it is you innately and uniquely provide to the community, provide to this world. Today, many of us live in a society that does the total opposite of that. We live in a society that tries to imprint on many of us on a mass scale an identity an identity of who we should be, how we should be, and what we are. It can happen through propaganda. It can happen through programming, through media, through even books, through the education system. And what this does is it implants a personality into you, sure enough. But the real you is often suppressed. It lies dormant in many cases. Every once in a while it may come out. But here's the thing. There are many who are very susceptible to the programming. They just are. And they always will be. But there are some that no matter what attempts are made to program them, it just doesn't take. There are some that no matter how much exposure they get to the mass media, to the peer on peer influences, the peer pressure, the temptations, and experiences that are way outside of their element, their inner element, they still are a unique type of individual deep within. And the evidence of that is in many of the things that they do. Now, if you're that type of person, sometimes you may be discouraged for a season, and that season may be a couple of years. It may be a decade. You can be discouraged. And you can be swayed away from your natural rhythms, your natural modalities. You can be swayed in such a way where you have a persona that allows you to work well in financial environments or financial situations, business situations that allow you to build a life, to survive, to move on in terms of being able to interact with this world. But 
I am not here to debate all of that, and I'm not here to dissuade you from that. What I want to point out is a way to know yourself, even if that is something that you know in private. That's something that only you know. Whether or not you share that with others is up to you. But I'm going to show you something here that is going to shed light on knowing yourself or knowing why it's important to know yourself. So here's a nice article on Better Up written by Alea Cooks Campbell. And here's some good things to keep in mind. Knowing yourself allows you to be more authentic. And the one person you must always be the most authentic with is yourself. And that will become clear here in a little while. But the more authentic you are with yourself, the more you can be true within yourself, then the more confidence you're going to have. Again, we're not talking about concepts out in the clouds. We're talking about things that are actionable. How does this relate to action in the world rather than just a fun, playful, entertaining, philosophical uh, concept or thought experiment? Because ultimately we want to be more effective. And effectiveness starts with self-knowledge, self-reflection. Socrates is probably most famously associated with the concept of knowing yourself. But this idea, this reality of knowing yourself did not begin with Socrates. It goes back much further. I would say it goes all the way back to the Sumerians and then into Kemet. And so when you know yourself, you are knowing about what you like and what you do not like, what you believe and what you value, your boundaries. Bound, boundaries are so important. They're so important. Your personality traits. It also helps you be a better team player because we're talking about that action part. How do you align? How do you align with others? How do you make the best contribution? Having a clearer path in your professional life. You can get on the path of success. At least this is what many others who are very successful say. The most successful people that I know about, they say the one thing you've got to know is your goals. You've got to have a path that you are on. You have to have a purpose and you've got to live your purpose. I've reverse engineered that to understand that you more clearly understand your purpose when you understand yourself. That's what this is all about. Many people struggle with finding a purpose and sometimes they find a fake purpose and it works. You can get wealthy, you can get acclaim, you can get influence even with a fake purpose. But you can do more powerful things with a real purpose. A real purpose comes from a real person, and a real person is that person that's deep within. And everyone has a real person deep within, but not everyone is going to discover that real person. But if you are watching this and listening to this, I have some tools for you. But let's continue. Understand how you interact with others. And yes, you do have to calibrate how you interact with others. But you know how to do that in a way where there's no inner conflict with working with others successfully, while at the same time making sure that the balance of what you're contributing is the right balance coming from within yourself. Recognizing your core personal values. And you can only truly have 
compassion for others and love for others when you love yourself and you have compassion for yourself. And that takes that personal intelligence. And then that's where you get to your life's purpose. And then this is a tool that helps you with self-motivation. See, these things that people advise you on, coach you on, to be self-motivated, to be driven with a goal, with a purpose. Again, I see these things as external. They seem internal, but they're actually external. What springs forth comes from within. And what comes from within is what you identify. It just sits there. And in some cases, you have to create it. The seed is there. But you have to water it. And in that watering, you are creating, you're sculpting it. And the way that you do this, in terms of understanding all the dimensions of who you are, that helps with adaptability. I say helps, not guarantee, but helps with adaptability. So that's what knowing yourself uh, does in terms of benefits, right? knowing your quirks, flaws, insecurities, being more confident. You can read dozens of self-help books and articles and podcasts, you name it. And all these things that you see here, all these, all these different uh, points here, you're going to see them in majority of these podcasts. Know your quirks, flaws, insecurities, work towards self-love, Build on your weaknesses. Uh, work out your personality flaws. Be less stressed. You can achieve all these things. And I've achieved the majority of these things. Not perfectly in every case, but I've worked on these things since about 2007. The, yeah, the year 2007 is, is really my starting point on really working on myself. I started reading self-help help books back in uh, the year 1996 or 1997, I believe. But it really didn't start to take until about 2007. And from that point until today, you know, I've actually achieved the majority of these. But there, it's a pattern across self-help books. And so repetition and constant exposure is going to get you to this. But the thing of it is, is that a gap in many of the self-help books is knowing yourself because it has been elusive until now to really work towards an actual a tool that you can use to understand yourself. Now, this tool is not new, but it's now been modernized. Okay. So when we go and we look at the studies, right, that are out there, there are different studies out there where we can analyze writing, we can, we can analyze um, academic work, we can, we can do a wide range of things where we can understand people and their tendencies based on how they express themselves. Right. And so this is all roughly related to what we call the intelligence quotient or IQ. Right. So when we think about IQ, historically, we thought of those with a very high IQ as being very smart. But, you know, there's been some 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 clarification on that where. We know that being book smart or being very intelligent in one dimension is not the end all and be all of intelligence. Intelligence is so wide ranging, right? But this type of intelligence that focuses on mathematics, reading, writing, verbal facility, and so on, those are still important things and an important aspect of who you are. And it's like, can you really understand someone's intelligence based on 
how they speak and how they write? And the answer is yes, you can do that. And when you are able to do that to a certain level, knowing how this person comprehends information, how they form ideas and thoughts, at least in a general way, then you're also able to understand more about that person, including understanding yourself. And so knowing yourself helps you with growth. It helps you with healing. It helps you with change. And as this person is speaking about here, it's, it's age-old wisdom. And when you tap into that wisdom, you start to see all the patterns of your behavior, all the patterns of your life. And when you can see the patterns of your behavior, when you can see the patterns of your life, then you know what you can do with patterns. You can change them. You can shift them. You can harness them. So that's pretty much the overview on knowing yourself, right? And like I said, this concept has existed throughout time. Shakespeare has talked about it. Alexander Pope has talked about it. Ralph Waldo Emerson has talked about it and so on, right? And it is the tool, the central tool for maximizing who you are. So that's what we want to do here is build this personal intelligence because what are we talking about in today's time? We're talking about artificial intelligence. Well, artificial intelligence is a mirror of real intelligence. Yes, if you've watched some of my earliest videos on artificial intelligence, you would see some doubts and some critique about AI. I admit that. But I've grown through my own self-knowledge, my own self-reflection, to see the, the glass more half full than half empty. I actually do not embrace the whole Skynet, Terminator, dystopia, end of the world type of views on artificial intelligence because when I look in myself, I don't see the world that way anyway, outside of technology. I am one who is more of a idealist. I am more of an optimist. And so I trend towards what, what is going to be beneficial in society and existence. So we have the opportunity today to not only use artificial intelligence as an artificial means or as a technical means to apply intelligence of the traditional IQ uh, style. But we also have the potential to use artificial intelligence as a means to amplify personal intelligence, to know more about ourselves and to understand ourselves. And so I started down this road somewhat accidentally. So I have a couple of blogs out there, right? And I have approximately 11 to 12 blogs and I actively maintain between four to seven of them. One of these blogs where I talk about just life in general, I have about 591 articles that I have published on this blog since 2012. And I have a technology blog where I've published 515 articles since 2011. This is actually my very first blog right here. And so between these two blogs alone, I have just over a thousand articles. And these articles are my personal writings. They're a reflection of my viewpoints over a 13 year period. So I said, you know, what if I took these blogs, right? And I exported them out to a file. Right, because you can export these blogs out to a file. So I exported them out to a file. Right, and I'm building a AI assistant that is going to be representative of my personality. That's going to be representative of me. So it needs content in order to do that. 
And what better content than what I've actually wrote, what I've actually thought. And so that's what I put together. And so I decided to, you know, and, and this is some of the articles I've written over a multitude of years, right? And, you know, I talk about um, civilization. I talk about infrastructure. I talk about how to build a better society through universal basic income, how that would actually work and how we can implement that. I've put a lot of thought into that and written detailed uh, plans for that, right? And really doubled down on that and how we can create a different society based on these ideas that exist and how we can turn them into action that would benefit people, how we can solve homelessness, how we can solve poverty. But I said, you know, while I'm doing this, let, let's, um, let's build a context for this AI assistant. And so I started with the question, how do you use ChatGPT to mirror the views, sentiments, and perspectives of a person? How do you use ChatGPT to mirror the views, sentiments, and perspectives of a person? So, ChatGPT, in its uh, particular way, is going to build an overview, and you know that's how you start the context. And so, then what I did is I took one of the blogs. Keep in mind, this particular blog represents 12 years of writings. And I told it to take its time to analyze the file and develop a sense of the author's views, perspectives, ideology, philo philosophy, and overall persona. And for those that are watching this, this is an example of objectively getting, objectively getting a perspective on yourself. Because you can ask your friends about you. You can ask your spiritual advisor about you. And you can even ask your therapist or psychologist about you. But that all is good information. Here's another way of doing it. So it said, you know, I have a philosophical and reflective approach to life. And balanced perspective on tradition and modernity. I don't see one as better than the other. I look for a, a balance, a harmony between those. I would love to see a type 3 or type 7 civilization based on a Karshoff scale, right? I would love to see that. That would be outstanding. But as you evolved in that, I thought about this deeply over 20 years and it's like if you're going to evolve technologically and you're going to have a Star Trek like future with elements of a Star Wars type backdrop then you don't want to drink that Kool-Aid too much because in that you can lose your humanity you can lose the sense of what is truly organic in terms of food soil light air and those things will continue to be important in the fundamental evolution of human biology. To make everything a machine is to go down the road towards death. And so I love life. And I see organic materials in their true evolved state without too much interruption or manipulation by humans as well as non-humans as the way for humans themselves to grow and evolve. So you, you take both. You take ancient knowledge and you take advanced technology. You unify them in a way that you have the best of both worlds. And so that's kind of how I look at look at the world, and that's pretty much how I look at everything. 
and how you integrate ethics, morals, and spirituality with the opportunities that exist. Because the better your morality, the higher your morality, then the higher quality your decisions will be. It's not the same as making the most amount of money, but it's more of you are able to make that money in a more sustainable way, in a way that is far less susceptible to conflict and infighting, implosion, and dissolution of the very outcome that you arrived at when you gained that money, gained that influence, gained that power. How does it benefit all rather than just the self? And then how do you remain rational while being spiritual? So the analysis of my writing rightly surfaced these these values that I have, humanist, humanistic values and personal growth and cultural awareness because cultural diversity is a good thing. Homogeneity, as we see it in nature, if there's too much homogeneity, then you have a, a gross and elevated decline in evolution. And if there are things like uh, just just use an example of, let's say, pathogens. It's easier to decimate a civilization on the uh, part of a single pathogen, right, when there's a, a greater level of homogeneity, homogeneity than there would be if you had diversity. And so that's basically what it came up with, but... It was doing that based off of a blog that was much more philosophical, much more about life, much more about the things that I look at from a, a social, political, spiritual, and general context. But I also wrote 591 uh, articles or 515 articles on technology, right? So you have to take that into account as well. Otherwise, you don't have a full picture. And so, what does the analysis of, of technology, um, of my technological writings, uh, 13 years of that, what, is that, what, is that um, what insights can be drawn from that? Technical depth and precision. Commitment to open standards and infrastructure. Balanced critical analysis. And long-term vision and strategic thinking, not just the things that can work today, but how do you build something that will last for generations? You know, if they just built the pyramids in, in what we call Egypt, if they just built those pyramids to last 100 years, there wouldn't be anything for anybody to write about. There wouldn't be anything for anyone to imagine or be inspired about if they had only built the pyramids to last just 100 years, or even or even 500 years. But look how long those pyramids have been there. Or the temples at Angkor Wat. Or the great infrastructure or structures in the Forbidden City in China. You can go way across the world and you can see what we now call Ruins, but I don't think that's a good name because they're not ruins. They're still largely intact. They're not ruined, right? The Acropolis in Greece, right? The Parthenon. These are things that inspire us on virtues of quality, reliability, durability, heightened growth and building heightened nature and thought. And so when you are inspired by those things, then that actually permeates 
and percolates into all the things that you would build, that you would participate in. You're not focused on just this quarter of results. You're not, you're not guided by three months of activity. You're guided by 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years of reputation, of legacy. And so respect for complexity and interconnected systems. I'm not one that says we should pursue complexity, but complexity is inevitable. And due to its inevitability, how we can work with things at a foundational level allows us to work across these connected points within a complex system so that we can tune and reorient those systems to our benefit. And so when we combine these two analyses together, right, we end up with holistic thought perspective. We look for empowerment and decentralization. I actually believe in centralization, but only as a practical tool in a certain context, but not as an absolute tool in all contexts. Decentralization oftentimes works better in more instances, and we see that in nature as well. Long-term strategic vision and analysis and analytical mindset balanced by ethics or what I would strive for, a higher morality. Commitment to mastery and best practices, one trillion percent. I'm all about that. How do you become the master of that which you are involved in? Even things that you may not like all the way. You don't have to like something in order to master it, but you master it so that you are more effective in your total life because you are as effective as the weakest part of you that you can make strong. And that's why universal mastery is key. So I'm actually setting all of this up so that I can enhance my custom instructions in ChatGPT, but this entire dialogue will also become an input into an AI assistant that I'm building based off of a model of who I am. But as I go through this, right, I'm able to use this to build insights on myself that I know is also operating in the AI assistant. And then you can take this further, right, and you can ask more questions and you can say, okay, what is my, what is my writing style, right? So that I can see if I agree with this or if I want to change it. Because sometimes to know yourself is also to know what you want to change, but you can't change anything you don't know about. I know that makes sense. So, sophisticated and reflective writing style. Structured and meth methodical. That's my writing style. That's not necessarily my talking style. Keep in mind, our intelligence shifts depending on what we're doing. It's the same intelligence, but many people would agree that the way I talk doesn't often reflect the way that I write. Because in most cases, when I'm talking with uh, people in the fields and environments that I deal with, I find that a much more simplified and streamlined way of talking is more effective. But when I write, especially on my blogs, it is an opportunity for me to fully express myself in how I like to use verbal syntax or I uh, use grammatical syntax. And so that's what comes out here in my writing style. Uh, tone, analytical, and intellectual. Um, some would even say professorial. Authoritative, yet accessible, though we could say accessibility is somewhat under... in. Uh, in debate, right? And um, estimated intelligence quotient, again, we're talking about a, a specific type of intelligence, not total intelligence. But in the typical IQ, uh, the est it's estimated 145 plus. 
but I would say that my real IQ is probably closer to 180. Evidence of strategic foresight, looking ahead and seeing what's going to happen based on past and present patterns is the way I like to look at things. Um, the, the writing difficulty, you know, how would this writing be judged in terms of its difficulty level? Uh, complex, um, those that, that read this type of uh, writing that, you know, the way I write on these blogs, they, they might say, hey, um, this, this is some deep stuff and um, it takes a while to try to try to process that. You know, it flows out of me very easily, but others may say, hey, this, this takes a while to, to go through. And in some cases, you would need some domain-specific knowledge. Uh, sophisticated vocabulary. And the way I look at it is some people say you shouldn't use big words. But the way I look at big words is it's just a simpler package for a bundle of ideas that it would take longer to express verbally. That if I use bigger words then I can actually use shorter sentences. So it's main, mainly based on efficiency more than anything else, right? And I find that what some would term large words, big words, those big words, they are much more connected to what you can see visually in your mind. Like you have things that you can see in your mind and you may actually have a picture of it. Not, not an actual paragraph, not an actual paragraph, but a picture. There are many people, I think, that think that way. They see life in pictures, not in words, not in books, not even in numbers, but they see images. It's the holographic view of reality, right? And so there are certain words that fit certain images in the mind better than others. And when you try to unwrap that through smaller words, then you got a longer trough, you got a longer road to travel to get that total picture. But if you could actually use those larger words and the audience could actually connect with those words, then the amount of visual and what you would call graph encoding would be much more, um, would be richer and it would uh, digest well in an instant. Readability, grade 16 plus, um, basically equivalent to master's degree. Uh, complex syntax, right? Uh, postgraduate level, um, cross-disciplinary, right? Not just IT, not just software development, but philosophy, ethics, strategic studies. Um, clarity level, coherence. Um, so... Yes, it is complex writing that I do most of the time, but despite that, there is a logical progression of ideas. It's very systematic. At least that's what my manager at work says. He says, you're the only person I've ever met that um, speaks in a very systematic way that actually uh, makes sense that works out to an actual conclusion. And, you know, yeah, and sometimes I don't do that, you know, especially when um, I'm a little leery or cautious about whether someone can follow a systematic dialogue. And usually when I have to deviate significantly from that type of dialogue, then I can also experience communication, commu communication breakdown. But conceptual precision, right? I do, um, I, I do admire and have a greater appreciation for precision. Absolutely, as well as refinement. Intellectual engaging. Let's just put it this way. I'm intellectually engaged by my ideas and by what I write and how I write. And so I think that's what's reflected here more, more, more than what the audience would find intellectually engaging. Uh, persuasion, persuasive. Um, I would rank persuasiveness lower, right? Because, um, you know, the goal of most of my writing is not to persuade, but simply to lay out a particular point of view. And that's how I operate in real life as well, is I spend uh, far less time on uh, persuading and persuasive modes of communication 
than I do on, it's just something I do naturally and instinctively. And maybe that I have been influenced by both my education and my heavy participation in the software arts and sciences and engineering. Maybe my long work with computers uh, influences that. But again, you know that about yourself. And that's the overall scope of this is knowing who you are. And so, you know, when you do all of this, um, it's like, okay, what can I do with this? So I asked a question that kind of uh, points in that direction, right? So now when you use a tool like this, again, at the beginning of the discussion, what did I say? I said that there's a tool we can use now to understand ourselves in a much more uh, precise and a much more uh, structured way than in the past. And now when we understand ourselves using these tools, can we also use these tools to see what are better alignments, what are a better match in terms of relationships? in terms of careers, in terms of events and causes and organizations that we may participate in, and so on. Well, I started down that road here by saying, okay, what can I do? Um, And other people who are very, I would say very insightful, empathic people have said similar things in the past. They really have. And some of these things have been said to me recently. Uh, In the past, I have been pointed towards academia and research. I've always avoided that. But, um, yes, many people said that's the number one thing. Um, I was actually rejected for a job um, not too long ago where they said um, they they thought that um, it was a job where I was um, going to lead a software team. And um, my interviewing style was very comprehensive. But... They said that they rejected me ultimately because I was much, I came off as much more academic than, um, because I knew, I knew everything about the topics that were raised, but they didn't see enough, um, um, execution, right? And so, and I thought that was a fair point because I had evolved. You know, if you had, uh, interviewed me 10 years ago, I was much more, um, field oriented in terms of how I would respond in certain interviews but in recent years I've been much more involved in managerial supervisory type of um, uh, activities and so I think that kind of merged with my technical background to bring me more into this type of uh, profile in terms of how I express myself but it also pointed out that strategic and executive leadership Um, this was said to me very recently, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was said that it was said that, um, I probably, um, need to be uh, more in this, this, uh, arena here. Um, we'll just have to see government and public policy. This was originally what I was going to do, uh, with my life, but I decided not to do that either. Um, you know, I was offered a job, you know, uh, many years ago. Um, as a GS 13 or 14 or something like that. Um, So anyway, with the federal government. But yeah, I thought about being a a public policy analyst in the U.S. federal government, but I decided I didn't want to do that either. Uh, Think tanks and policy institutes. um, I had some some relatives that um, knew people in this uh, arena, in this type of work, and they knew me. These relatives knew me and said, um, you really need to think about this. And I was like, hmm. But I rejected that path as well. Um, but it's just funny that this tool, this, this um, text predictor, this generative AI, it uh, maps out the same types of recommendations people have made to me throughout my life. And I, I think this is, this is interesting. I have worked in organizational strategy, corporate strategy, um, International relations and global affairs, some very small exposures to that. Legal and ethical advisory roles, yeah. Um, um, editorial and thought leadership. Um, so yes, um, so yeah. And I actually um, relate well to all of this. Um, and so 
I had to uh, share this because I'm actually going to continue this thread of conversation uh, it, with this um, AI assistant. But before I do so, because it's going to be, it's going to get very, very personal uh, here. I'm, get, I'm, going, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to have a conversation with this AI uh, tool about Myers-Briggs and about all kinds of things. I'm just going to really uh, load the deck when it comes to an AI assistant that represents my tone, my, uh, my perspectives. But this is a way you can actually use these tools to actually reflect on yourself and to see things um, in a, not just a broader way, cutting across industries, cutting across um, events or institutions, or let's say um, organizational roles, community roles that you may uh, get involved in, or even if none of that, just um, understanding, okay, yeah, I can see how I can be this way, and then the next question and the final question then becomes, okay, okay, what will I do with this? And you will find that as you start asking those questions, this is what I do naturally. This is who I am naturally. You put more of your effort in these things that you do naturally, that you align with, then you're going to see a tremendous amount of success. So if you have any questions about this process or about any of this, uh, shoot me a, um, let, let me let me word it this way. Um, let's be respectful in the comments. Let's be um, civil and charitable. If you have civil and charitable comments, uh, thoughtful comments to share, then Let's engage and talk more about this if you um, feel the need or you would like to explore um, certain things. But uh, until then, I wish you well, and I will see you, as we say on many of these videos, on the next one.